Okay, folks. saw a three-letter key big. We have a message, the boy has the ball, and then by shifting each letter of the plain text by the amount that the key specifies, we've now essentially shifted uh, every third character by a different Caesar cipher amount. Cool. Okay. So, we have this key, we need to know, we want to try to understand. Um, so first, so we, we have, we've talked about maybe general technique to try to attack this cipher. Um, what do we need to try to determine first? Yeah. The key length. The key length, why is the key length important? some interesting patterns that we saw that still made it through the encryption. 
encryption process into the ciphertext from the plain text. Yeah. Yeah, the is encoded twice as OPK, and even more, uh, THED is encoded as OPKW. Right? And we talked about that this is because the it just so happened that those characters in the plain text were repeated and they were exactly <coughs> They were exactly the amount of the key off. So the exact same parts of the key were over those same characters. Cool. So how does that help us then uncover and try to determine the period of the key? between THE and the, the ciphertext is, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nine, there's nine difference between the repetitions. So we know that the key must, should either be nine or some divisor of nine, right? So it could be, um, yeah, so it could be, it's three in this case, we know exactly what it is, um, but it, this tells us it's very likely. So what should we probably do here? Where are the repetitions? Anybody remember? Um, the double O. O, D, Q, O, O, G. All right, let's see if I can do this. E, Q, O, O, G. And the O before it. And the O before it is repeated. O, E, Q, O, O, G. Yeah, so that's a pretty good difference. That is, let's see, I think these are groups of five. So, uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. So 30 apart. Any others? MOC. MOC? Feels like a massive course just without the online part. MOC. And where's the other one? There we go. Awesome. Uh, we could count that. What is that? That's uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, <coughs> 72. Is that right? 72 or 75. All right. I have it on another slide. We'll just say it's some length. You can count it later. Any others? Could you write a program to do this? Probably. Not probably. The answer should be yes. <laughs> you can write a program to do this. Right? You're just looking for repetitions. You can spit out the repetitions, what the difference is. And so this is the uh, basically exactly what we talked about, that uh, repetitions in the ciphertext occur when the characters of the key appear over the same characters in the plain text. And this can happen for a lot of reasons, like we saw with common words like the, repeated often in the plain text. It's highly likely that those, and then it's more likely that the key will go over them. Uh, but yeah, so we already saw this here. So we know that in this case, uh, or I guess I should say we don't know for certain, because again, this could uh, just be due to chance. It's possible that this just happens randomly. Um, so we have that the, diff the difference is nine, so the period is a factor of nine. It could be one, it could be three, or it could be nine. Right? We could easily, how could we easily check if it was one? Swap that around. Yeah, if the key is length one, what does that mean? It's a Caesar cipher, so we can break that using all the stuff we already talked about. We can do frequency analysis, we can just brute force all possible keys. Awesome. Okay. So we can look at this in here. Um, you can stare at this for a long time. You can write a program to do this. And you could do all of the, um, so we can also do all of the two character repetitions, not just three. So we can do two character, three character, <coughs> and as many as we can. Um, and we'll get a ton of them. So uh, we have MI, OO, um, distance 10 and 5, OEQ, OOG, 
was distance 30, as we said, where was the move? It was 72. Yeah, look at that, I can count. Um, so it could be, 72 is kind of a lot, it could be um, six, it could be um, any kind of, of these factors and combinations. Is that right? Yes. Um, let's see, so, Let's think for a minute like this one, QO. The factors are seven and seven. <laughs> Compare that one to all the other ones. Right? Probably unlikely. Right? So this is probably one that just happened by chance because what does it make sense that uh, everything else is telling us it's either something with fives or twos or threes, but this says, well, it must be at least seven. That's um, Highly unlikely, so we can probably rule this out as a. So we can probably rule this out as maybe like a serious result. What should give us the most confidence that it actually occurred because of repetitions in the uh, key and the plain text? The really long string. The long one, yeah. We should look at the longest string first, right? Again, it's important not the distance. The distance doesn't matter. Right, that's just uh, how far apart they are, but how long the repetition is. So this is the longest one, O E O E cube. So we could start there, and we need to look and say, okay, it's thirty. So the factors are two, three, and five, which could mean it's either is any of those comics. So it could be one, two, three, five, six, ten, fifteen, or thirty. Do we just try all of those? I don't know. What, what would your intuition be at this point? Three. Could be three. What else? Yeah. Six. Six. What else? What can we use to maybe validate those hypotheses? Check the other ones. Yeah, we can look and see what of those sense with all the other ones, right? So we have uh, we have twos, threes, five, we say it's probably not 30, that seems kind of crazy, like to use a key of like 30 with a, uh, what was there, about 100, 150 characters or something? Okay, so now let's look, let's see, okay. So we were looking at and considering we we're looking at and considering uh, so we're not gonna are we gonna consider one? No, it kind of seems silly, right? We could just test that. Pretend it's a Caesar cipher, break it that way. Um, so we were looking at two. So we say three and six, are those what we said? Maybe five. So one, two, three, five, six. All right, so let's think for a minute. Okay, so if it was, okay, one we're gonna rule out immediately. Two, all right, can we rule out two? Yeah. Thoughts? Because you have that uh, larger sequence, could you like weigh it heavier by like saying that maybe that's more valid because it is a lot longer sequence? Yes, so that's why we're starting with that sequence and we're doing all of the um, uh, multiples here. So that's why we got the <laughs> one, two, three, five, six, uh, I think it was 10, 15, and 30. So we're going to start with those as our possible set. We'll winnow that down a little bit, and then we'll try to see which of these matches up most with the rest of them, right? knowing that it could be spurious or it could be not spurious. Um, so let's think of things maybe that we can rule out. Uh, what about five? Mm -hmm. Like two and three are factors of a lot of them, but five is. 
Yeah, so two, if we look at two, right? Two is a factor of a lot of them, actually. Almost all. Uh, three is a factor of not all of them, but more, right? Three, 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 three. Um, and we can also weight, with our weighting, we can weigh the MOC heavier than the other ones, right? So we can see, okay, it's in here, that's good. Uh, what about five? Five is in two, only in two of them? Three. Three, well, three including this one, but that's why we have it up here, right? So it's in the longest one, but the only other time five appears is in uh, MI and OO. So we can probably say, well, we can maybe ignore five. What about six? Five of them? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six of them, including both of our longest. So what do we think? Yeah. Why have we ruled out four? Ah, so four is Yeah, four is not a divisor of 30, so that's what we're, uh, we've listed all the divisors of 30, um, and or at least we did that on the other slide, and so we copied all of the smaller ones, so we kind of got rid of 10 and 15 and 30, saying those are probably pretty big, we can check those later if we need to, um, and we can also maybe rule those out here, because we looked at five and we said, well, five only appears in three of them, um, so let's get rid of five, but if you get rid of five, you have to get rid of 10 and 15. That is a, I think the answer is no, because that's a different repetition. So it's included, it starts at 22, which is actually before this, and goes to, and the next repetition is at 27. Um, so it's not, yeah, we wouldn't use a subset of the same one because that doesn't give you more information, yeah. I just wanna make sure I'm following mm -hmm. correctly. We, we have eliminated We've eliminated four because it's not a divisor of 30. So we're only looking at all the numbers that divide 30 evenly because those are what the key length could be, which makes sense with the <coughs> largest input. So that's why we're starting with uh, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 10, 15, and 30. Does that make sense? Like a key length, if the key length was four, So we have, we've eliminated five, so we can maybe rule out uh, some of these that have, well, two, we, we can't rule out, eh. All right. I just got rid of one. I can't. Okay, great. Okay. 
So we look at this, we, we have two and three, two is in a lot of places, um, three is in a lot of places, and six, the combination of them is in a good amount of places. What do we have? So this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, four, five, six. Six, including both of our largest, also have six in them. So I say it's probably a good bet to try that one first. I don't know. Anybody have a strong argument for not doing that? Yeah. Uh, I was curious, like, how, would you want to lean towards a, a longer um, amount or not? I like, like a larger amount or not in general? Because if there's like a lot of characters, wouldn't it make sense if he wouldn't really only be like two? Or is that assuming? Yeah, you, I mean, you use your intuition of the problem and I mean, if you want to metadata game it, if this was an assignment too, you'd also want to be like, well, a two character string is probably not that interesting, like a two character key, because that can be trivially brute force, and so it's probably something longer-ish, and we saw all of the, uh, the key space that we did on Tuesday, right, of all the different sizes, so yeah, you, I think you factor that into your guessing. Wouldn't using the larger ones first anyway, or the larger multiples of the smaller ones first anyway, uh, be better in general because the smaller ones would be substrings of that key, so it would yes, be captured actually, that's by. Yes, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, this is good. Um, actually, this happened happened a lot last semester. So um, you could consider this key a nine character key. That is VIG, VIG, VIG. Or you could consider it a six character string that's VIG, VIG. Or a three character string that's just VIG, VIG. Um, so, yeah, in a big case like this, you'd want to try maybe the, large, the largest number because that will at least tell you if you're wrong immediately. So, well, I, okay, let's put it this way if it was a three character key and we treat it like a six character key, we would see that the key was the same thing repeating, and so there we we've, we've solved it and we figured out the key. Cool. Okay, so we already. Yeah, so we kind of this was our kind of reasoning that we did. We can also look at it of how many of them have twos in their factors, how many have threes. So maybe we try six first, uh, but we want to check. So how can we check? So we have this, how do we check that six is correct? <coughs> yeah? Can we just divide a section on C to look at their occurrences to see like people do? Yeah, so if we looked at the frequency of this whole text of all the characters, we'd see something that was closer to uniform. Because all the frequencies get all mixed up and put together. But if we split this into alphabets, where every sixth character is in its own alphabet, and we graph and we think about the frequencies there, each of those should approximate English. Right? The problem that we have is now we have, we talk about sample size, we're only sampling from a sixth the size of our, of our uh, ciphertext now, so the noise gets a little bit higher. Uh, but yeah, that's essentially the, the idea, is we can look at, split this up, and try to run some, we can use the same statistical measures we did before, uh, I'll show you a different statistical measure. So this is just showing you different types of ways to check, is this text that I'm looking at, is it English text but shifted? Um, so, so we can use, and this is not to uh, say that this is a better or worse way. So we could do the, uh, essentially the frequency analysis. Um, wait, where are we at? So we could do our uh, statistical frequency analysis and, and determine, um, oh wait, that's not true. This is the correct shift. We could use that later. Uh, sorry, we're going to use a different measure. Yeah. Okay. We're going to use uh, the index of coincidence, which is the probability that two randomly chosen letters from the ciphertext will be the same. So think about English. This is kind of, uh, in some sense, uh, a 
one measure that we'll look at that tries to see how English-ish is this text. Um, so for instance, um, if you, let's see, if you randomly, uh, let's look at the math and then we'll go back. Yeah, okay. So, all right. <coughs> Have you taken statistics yet? Like a yes and a nose. Something? You know something about probabilities, right? Yeah? Okay, me too. Uh, okay, so the index of coincidence, we're going to do, um, so it's essentially a, we're going to, what is the probability that we choose two characters from whatever, cybertext, anything? We're going to choose two things. What's the probability that they're the same? Probability of the first times the probability of the second. Yeah, so the probability of the first, so the probability that it is that character, and then the probability of what's left that it is that character. Let's see if that's right. Yep, okay, cool. So we'll use this, we'll call this fi is the frequency of character i. Um, so we can do this for, well, yeah, so we have uh, fi, okay, cool. So we have fi is the frequency of that character, so just how many of that character appears in our ciphertext. So if I want to know for a, what's the, uh, what's the probability of getting a? I could say, well, it's uh, the frequency of A times the frequency of A minus 1. But I need to divide that by what? So I want the probability. So frequency here, we're just saying is the count, like how many there are. Yeah. Divide by N for the F A and n minus 1 for f a minus 1. Times n minus 1. Everyone agree? So this is the probability that I pick two letters from my ciphertext and they're both a's. What if I want to calculate that probability for every single letter in the alphabet? Right? So I do, I'm going to use sigma to represent the alpha. Oh, no, that's ugly. I'm just going to call this ic. So I want to calculate this for all letters of the alphabet, right? So I could do uh, f of a, uh, I'm going to stop doing it like that, <coughs> times f of a minus 1 uh, divided by n times n minus 1, and I'm going to add to this f of b times what? F of, B minus F of B minus 1 over N times N minus 1. Do I need to keep writing this? Good, because I'm running out of room. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to dot, dot, dot that. And I can do something a little bit nicer. I can say this is the sum of, uh, we'll turn these into numbers now. Uh, we, you know, it doesn't really matter. We can say, uh, yeah. Zero is less than equal to i, which is less than equal to, what do we got, 256, 25? 25 characters. So for all 25 characters, we're going to do the f of i times the f of i minus 1. So the frequency of that specific character times the frequency of that character minus 1 divided by n times n plus n minus 1. Everyone agree? And we can simplify this a little bit further. By how? Yeah, we can 
can take out the ends because they don't have anything to do with the summation, right? You can think about it up here. We could factor out this and just multiply all the summation of all of these by 1 over n times n minus 1. So it just cleans it up a little bit. Okay, n minus n minus 1. So here we have it, and this is all just based on counting, right? There's nothing special that we're having here. n is just the size of the ciphertext. And each f of i is the number of each of those letters in your hypertext. Cool. So this n, so this is kind of one statistical measure that tries to get at what's the aggregate multiple occurrences of characters in a certain hypertext, in actually any text. So you can apply this measure to English. And does this matter about shifting? So does shifting affect this? Right, so if I have A's in my plain text and I shift those all to Z's, does this measure care about that? No, because it's, it's summing up over all the letters. It doesn't care which letter is which, which makes it perfect for using on our ciphertext. So essentially, what you can think of what we're gonna do is use this measure we uh, people have pre-calculated this measure for English text, so we can use this measure multiple ways. A, we can use it to after we've split up our language into different alphabets, we can calculate the index of coincidence for each of those and see if it gets close to English. If it does, that means those are all in the same thing. We can also do what we talked about earlier and look at the frequency analysis. So we can look at the graph, compare that with English to see how close we are. Okay, so we can do exactly that. So this is, uh, so now we've split our ciphertext into six different alphabets, and we're just gonna calculate the index of coincidence for each of those. Yes? You said that there are pre-calculated values for English. What is, what are those? Yes, uh, I don't wanna get into too much. Uh, 0.066 for right now. We'll go come back to this in a second. Um, so, and again, remember the important thing to think about here, and again, this is a statistical measure. So here we have what? Uh, four. <coughs> 22 characters. Right, so we only have 22 characters, so these may vary uh, depending on what happens. But splitting it up into six, so we have uh, 0 0.069, 0 0.078, uh, 0 0.078. 0 0.056, 0 0.124, and 0 0.043. So which ones of these are roughly around 0 0.066? First one's pretty good. Second one? I mean, pretty good. Seems close. The third one? It's actually less far away than the first two. So. Yeah, pretty good. What about this one? No. no. Nope. And this one? Pretty far away. I don't know, but we can think of, we actually are pretty good, right? If they're all way off, we would know that this was probably just random. We messed up our period. We'd go back, double check that. And the other cool thing about the index of coincidence <laughs> is that you can calculate it for different periods. So you can, um, and maybe this helps us more when considering if those things match or not. So you can calculate it for a period of one, which is essentially no you know, English text. You can also, they've pre-calculated this for different periods of, and you can see as essentially as you get closer, as you get, as the period gets higher and higher, it gets closer to 1 over 26. The probability is equally likely for every character that you pull one and you'll pull, or it's, it's just random. So it's not based on any, distrib any distribution. So the characters are essentially random. So this is another way you could we could actually check. We could 
double check in multiple ways. We can um, compute, so for our ciphertext, the index of coincidence is 0 0.043, which is um, in between, it's like a little bit above five, but you can see these measures are very close to each other. So this is why you need to keep double checking. Um, so it indicates a key may be slightly larger than five. Um, but this is, again, now we're double checking our previous estimate. So this had nothing to do with repetitions or anything, right? So we've kind of, you can think of we've independently come to the same conclusion using two different methods. That the, that the key is likely to be um, six based on just computing this value and our analysis of the repetitions and then our double check analysis of looking at the index of coincidence for each of these alphabets. Questions? Yeah? Um, why did you, when you said it could be larger than five, did that mean you were just because you were testing with a value of five, is that why? Or? It is looking at this, so, sorry, we're gonna have to go back and forth a little bit. Oh, sorry, okay. So our index of coincidence is 0 0.043 in that ciphertext. <coughs> and then looking at here, 0 0.043, at least for the numbers that we have here, is somewhere between 5 and 10. But it's not going to be an exact estimate. And especially with the difference between 4 and 5 being 0 0.041. Or sorry, sorry, 0 0.001. It's a pretty small delta. So we, we use this to kind of ballpark are we roughly where we think we are. So now what do we do? <coughs> yeah, treat each of them like Caesar cipher. So I kind of mentioned this on Tuesday, but let's think. Should we just brute force each of these ones? Because we know they're a different key. We can brute force this, try all 26 combinations. But how do we know when we're right? It makes sense? Yes. So that's how we did it for the ciphertext, or sort of for the Caesar cipher, right? We took this um, value here, and we shifted all 26 values until we could read it. But the key difference was the letters in this alphabet are all the every sixth letter of the ciphertext. <coughs> so maybe the better way to read this would be something like this. So rather than thinking about, where are you? Pacing, the most difficult thing <laughs> for a computer. Okay. What? Okay. Okay. So rather than thinking about it like this, which is kind of um, where we're thinking and where we think brute forces may brute forcing may help us. What we really have to be thinking about each of these alphabets is um, something like this. So what did I do to this? Yeah, I left space for all the other letters. So all the other letters from all the other alphabets, right? So this is the very first letter of our ciphertext. The next <coughs> character is D, Q, Y, S, and M. And I left those as underscores. And then we have I. So if we tried to brute force this, we could generate all possible 26 values of this. But how will we know when we're right? Because we're missing those other five characters that give us the context clues in between that tell us if it's real English. Right. 
So we need to make educated guesses about each of the ciphers, maybe shift them, and then start thinking about putting them together and trying to make, essentially they're going to guess and check. So trying to figure out, okay, well I think this alphabet is shifted by this amount, and I think this other alphabet is shifted by this amount. Then when I put them together, maybe I can find words. I can find things like the, and that would help me break the next alphabet, and I could try that shift. But I may be wrong, so I may have to go back and, it's just like you guys do puzzles, Sudoku and stuff, right? You sometimes have to guess what is in a specific box. And then you see if that leads you to a contradiction, then you go back and change that, and hopefully you did it in pencil and not pen. <laughs> cool. So this is gonna be our plan. We're going to use the techniques for Caesar cipher, but we basically, it's not that we can't use brute force, but that if we were really to brute force this, you have to brute force all alphabets together, which is the same as trying to break the six character key, which means you're gonna have to guess a lot. All right, but I'm gonna show you. So, we can do exactly what we did before. We can calculate this statistical analysis. We can calculate the frequency of each of the shifts to see which gets us closer to this graph, which is exactly what we did before. Instead of just doing exactly what we did before, I'm gonna show you a different technique that we can use that's a little bit more granular um, to try to do this. So the idea is this graph is great, right, because it's, a literal distribution of English characters, but it's a bit much in terms of information and it's kind of hard, even if you remember when we were breaking that Caesar cipher of exactly what shift was what based on the frequencies. Um, so a different way to approach even this problem in a single Caesar cipher, but also here in a Visionaire cipher, is what we're going to do is count up So we're gonna take all the letters, put it on A through Z, and then for each alphabet, we're just gonna count up um, how many of each character appears in there. So this is just pretty simple. We're just literally counting in the first cipher text, there are three A's, one B, zero C, zero D, four, zero, one, one, and so on all the way through. And we can just do this for each of the cipher texts. This is not all of our alphabets. It's not kind of crazy. And then we'll simplify that model of the graph of English, simplify that down to just high, medium, low. So just think about it in those terms. So we have kind of this pattern. So you can think about with English, you have this pattern of high, mediums, high, mediums, high. So the highs are all the spikes. And then you have a series of lows at the end. So how does this help us, or does it? Yeah. We could rearrange each alphabet to follow that pattern. Yeah, we could see shifting this alphabet in these different ways. How does that affect and change this value? Right. So we can um, essentially try decrypting. Right. So we can even look at this first alphabet. Right, so the very first alphabet, ignoring everything else. How does that match up? Or what shift would you do? So let's think about, maybe you're thinking, okay, let's look, uh, E is the most frequent. Maybe that's actually A. So let's shift everything back by one, two, three, four. Shift everything back four. Oops. Right, and then what does that mean for this high? One, two, three, four. So now we've just put W as a very frequent character in this ciphertext, so that probably doesn't make too, too much sense. Yeah. It's actually really close, just not doing anything. It's actually really close, not doing anything? Is that good, bad? It could, mean it could mean the letter was A. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it could mean the letter was A, which kind of seems on the surface, silly, because we talk about Caesar ciphers, would you ever pick zero as your key? No. Right? Because if you pick zero, it's not going to encrypt your message. But in a visionary cipher, could you have one of, would you want the key of all A's? No. But could you have A's in your key? Yeah, because they're hidden by everything else. It's just not shifted at all. Right? 
So we could guess for the first alphabet, no shift. It actually matches very well. It has a peak set A is an E, uh, a peak at O. What about the second alphabet? Or So the other thing that's kind of nice, like let's maybe look at the third alphabet. The other thing I like to do is to look for like a series of lows because there's this nice part of the alphabet where kind of the ends are all, there's a one, two, three, four, five in a row of zeros. So if we were maybe to think about this as the end of the alphabet, what would that make this first character, I? A, which is kind of high, I mean two. So we'd have A, B, now I need like two fingers, which I can't show you here. Um, A, B, C, D, what would that make this? E, which is a high character frequency. E, uh, F, G, H, I, which is a high character frequency, is that right? Yeah, I is high character frequency. So maybe the third alphabet maybe shifts uh, A to I, whatever that shift is. So it would be an I as the, the shift. Everyone agree that maybe that would make sense? So this is exactly, so like I mentioned before, this is a puzzle essentially that you're trying to uncover. So uh, when you're doing this, it would take a while to try different things, try those shifts, see how that matches up. I know these answers, so I'm going to lead us to them, so we're not spending all day just working on this one problem. Um, but it's natural when you're doing this on your own for it to take a little while, so don't freak out when... Uh, but it's important to, if you get too stuck, maybe uh, you come to us for help, or you can double check your assumptions, maybe you got the key length wrong. And now you're trying to decrypt things that don't make sense. Um, okay, and we can look the sixth alphabet. So just kind of roughly looking at it, the sixth alphabet. Yeah. Okay. So V. Yeah. So here's another grouping of zeros. So shifting all of those to Z would map V to A, and you can see that the other ones kind of map up too. So we can maybe start with these three assumptions. So we can say, okay, what if we assume the first alphabet is A, so unshifted. The third alphabet maps uh, maps a to I, and the sixth alphabet, sixth alphabet moves, shifts A all the way to V. So now what do we do? Try it. So we can try it and try it with the ciphertext, right? So we can try shifting each of these three alphabets, which we know how to do with the Caesar cipher. And I'm going to put in, yeah, okay. So I'm going to put in bold the things that we think we know. So these are the three alphabets will be in bold with the other ones. And now what do we do? So one thing could be try root four thing. We could also just try seeing if we see any patterns with the bold characters. I think in the next slide it'll be, yeah, okay. Sorry, what? said A, J, E, and that was right above your mouse. Oh, That's yeah. I, I know. I'm just trying to see if there's anything else that anybody sees. So is there anybody? So the interesting thing is um, that we have at least the characters that are next to each other. We can try to see in any direction if we see maybe something that looks like the. Um, Uh, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, that'd be one thing to try. That's great. Keep that in mind. I don't know if that's right or not, so we'll see. <laughs> but that would be definitely something to try. What else? <coughs> yeah. There's also a TWE -W -T -W in going from the second line to the third that could be a the. Ah, yes, there we go. So there's a T W E, so that could be the T H E. 
Yeah, that's good. I'm really bad at word games, though, by the way. So this is something I'm very bad at, which is why I have all of you. And so, okay, anybody else have any ideas? Here, maybe bold is not the perfect choice, but uh, the M is not bold. It shouldn't be bold, right? Oh, no, it is bold? It is bold. Okay, yeah, yes, yes, yes. J is not, okay. So, yeah, you could try maybe, I don't know, mace or, I don't know, you could try whatever words are um, four-letter words that M, A, blank, E. Uh, a tricky thing, though, is not having spaces, so that also messes you up a little bit, is uh, there could be a space kind of anywhere within there, so we need to take that into consideration. Um, we could, and I don't know if I'd necessarily get here, but one way you could think about this is A-J-E. Um, you could treat just that as its own word and think of a popular three-letter word like that. So you could say R and maybe try that, so try mapping um, a to S for that alphabet. So you could say, okay, this looks maybe more, does it look English-y? We got where? Rick, uh, Pace. Yeah, so at least we're double checking now that at least that, does that guess make sense, right? So we can see, does that just make it all gibberish or did it actually? None, yeah, that's good. What was that? Uh, how did our the go? Did any of our thes pop up? T. R, oh, that's a good one. That's a good sign. None. Oh, R, there we go, nice. These spaces are really annoying. Goo, I don't know that that's a word. Goop. But, it's a common word. All right, anybody, what would you, so let's say we started from here, what would be next guesses, maybe? Uh, one, two. Sorry, I don't get the uh, numbering scheme. I thought I... Oh, fifth, yeah. Oh, 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 the, yeah, um, the clown are taking over. No. Oh, that's creepy, okay. The clown on Egos. Yeah, so we can try, okay, T-H-E, that would be one thing to try. That's a good one. Anybody have any other? Guesses? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. So that would that'd be a good guess. The last block only has one letter missing. So what would you guess, though? <laughs> McCann. Yeah, so actually, so one thing you could do is look up uh, dictionary words and you could see it because we could actually, yeah, this is a nice way to kind of brute force it because we can say, okay, A something, I mean, I guess you could have a entire phrase end with at or an or something, but that would be not great. You could say C-A-N, maybe can or something, or you could, maybe if it's all one word, you could look at like M-I-C-A, what's like a common ending for that? Um, what was that? 
mica, if it was a word, if maybe we knew something about this. Yeah, anybody have any other? Yeah. So it's not certain letters, it's alphabets. So what I'm doing is, so for instance, uh, here, mapping the second alphabet from A to S means I'm taking this alphabet, Duke, whatever, this, this alphabet. So starting with the second one, every character you're shifting from A to S, or sorry, from S back to A. So you're just doing the decryption operation there and then putting it back in with the ciphertext. And you could write a program to do this too. So it's actually kind of nice to be able to, just, I don't know, try different shifts and print it out together to see what it looks like. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Yes. Uh, which one? Oh, here, A and P. And, okay, and that, is that P the same? And then that would also be uh, good? Yeah, that's actually a great point, yeah. And you can look at like patterns, like M, I, C, A, L, like, and you only have one letter left, so what in the English language calls that? Like most commonly you think of like the letter L, right? Yeah, yeah, I like this goop. Maybe a better approach would be to color the remaining alphabets so we could see which ones are in the same alphabet so we could see that that good like that same p in two different places we think would be very nice to be d's so that would actually give us an excellent shift to try um okay if you're i guess really big on english you could do something like this and figure out that the last line uh, suggests a mikal a common ending for an adjective so that would shift the fourth fourth ab ugh. Yeah, and so at this point, we could brute force the last alphabet. We could, uh, what happened to our Ds? Did our Ds appear? It did? Where is it? Why can't I see it? Oh, it, yeah, the rose chain. Okay, that's why I was going crazy. <laughs> okay, uh, so good showed up, and our, our and, our good buddy and showed up. How is that? Why did I do that? <laughs> it's insane. All right. Yeah, so we can do anything. We can brute force it right at this point. That would be easy. Or we could do exactly all the cues that you're uh, thinking about. And we could do this. And then we got it. We could also use, um, let's see, QI here. So you could say that if we know it's a Q, we highly likely a U follows it. So we could try that. Uh, all kinds of tricks that you could try here. So we finally get our uh, plain text. Uh, I'm not gonna read it. You can read it on your own time. It's a silly limerick, but uh, you can't even read it. Left to right, top to bottom. Um, okay, I'm just gonna let you do this, so. There we go. I should have had you do that in the mic for everyone. <laughs> yeah, it's tricky. Um, yeah, so there we go. We just broke this cipher as a group, and you guys had much better intuition and uh, kind of paths to go with this, right? So you can see how this is kind of a uh, two drone adventure or puzzle, and you can try different ways of going, have to backtrack, and have to figure out different things. So it's really important um, when you're trying to solve one of these ciphers to look at it and make sure you understand and you're very clear about what assumptions you've made to get to where you are now, right? If you keep getting stuck and stuck and everything seems gibberish, maybe you made a mistake with either the period or uh, one of the other steps or maybe your code is wrong to do the decryption. This is what I've seen before. So you should, um, one of the best ways 
to practice this is if you have some visionary cipher algorithm, uh, take your own plain text that you know exactly what it is, encrypt it with a key that you know exactly what it is, and try to decrypt it by hand or with your tools. If you can't do it that way, then you're totally, you know, something is very wrong and you'll never be able to break it if you can't break something that you know what it is. Cool. Questions on this? All right. Cool. So the other type of cipher that we've talked about uh, before, so we talked about um, substitution ciphers, which is what we've been looking at, substituting one letter for the other. Um, we can also do transposition ciphers, which basically essentially change the letters in the plain text, in the plain text to produce cipher text. So you're doing no substitutions, which means you have this very nice property where you have the same one gram frequency. Right? The letter distributions are exactly the same because it is the English text that you have. It's just moved around. The letters are moved around. Um, what is going to be different, though? Yeah. The, say it again. The position of the letters, yes. Yes, exactly, with respect to the other letters. So one gram frequency is one character, two gram frequencies is a character of, the frequency of one character following another. So again, three gram frequencies are the three in the sequence. So all of those get mi mixed, up, mixed up and broken when you shift characters around. And you could look and, and uh, analyze, just like we analyze the one gram frequencies for English, you can analyze different um, n gram frequencies. And the interesting thing is that the index of coincidence is going to be exactly the same as in, uh, as English because we haven't done any substitutions. Um, so we can think of there's a number of different uh, substitution ciphers, or sorry, transposition ciphers. Um, so the idea is we could break a, um, so a simple one would be break the message into blocks, so blocks of letters, and the key is how you transpose and move around those blocks. So you could have a key of three, zero, two, one. So this means our block size is four. So we have to break the characters into blocks of four. And then the way this key works is the zero with character will go to the third index. The first character, I'm using zero indexing. I hope that's okay. Uh, the first character is going to the zero index the third character is going to the two, and the fourth character is going to one. So doing that swap and doing that swap on every single block. So you'll then get something like this. So again, we haven't completely, we just mixed up the order here. We haven't um, gotten anything. So you see, we moved uh, A to the last one to spot three. We moved S to zero to the front. We moved U to two in the same spot, so the U never moves, the third one doesn't move here, and the one goes back here. Pretty simple, it's called simple transposition cipher. So how would you attack this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can use basically the, the similar ideas and similar approaches to what we've talked about work here, right? We can look at each block and we can maybe say, what makes sense? Can we maybe make words or something by swapping some blocks around? Um, but what's the key size? So we tried to brute force. So how many possibilities are there here? Yeah. The key size? Correct, yeah, so we, we'll, let's ignore this problem for now. But yes, there is a problem inherent here that uh, if there's extra, let's say our message is always gonna be a, um, the correct offset of our blocks, of our um, key size. So what about a brute force? So how many four digit keys are there here, yeah?
Yes. Why? What's the operation? Yes. Yeah, so it's a factorial operation. So with a size of 4, it's 4 factorial, which is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And then with 5, it's 5 factorial. 6, 6 factorial. So you can think of, I don't know, that increases very quickly. So you can have, with a key size of 13, you have, uh, what is it, 6 billion different keys to try. So maybe brute forcing is a little bit more difficult. Um, but we have our friendly, friendly um, nice technique that we've been looking at of doing English analysis. And specifically, we uh, would want to look at likely bigrams and trigrams. So specifically looking at um, letters that are likely to follow other letters. And again, we'd use exactly the same techniques we'd used before. We'd look at each different block. We'd maybe analyze it to say, OK, what's the highest likelihood of one character following another? If there's Qs that Q and U in one block, we'd swap those so that they were next to each other, and then start working and going from there. Um, we'll see more of this in the next cipher. OK. So I don't know why that was messed up. I'm going to fix that real quick. OK. So the rail fence, but the problem here, the problem before is that we have these kind of the notions of blocks, right? So we're only mixing letters and swapping letters that are in one block. So a rail fence cipher is kind of a different, uh, clever way of how to do this. But essentially, the idea is you rearrange the plain text into a different format and then read it off differently. So for instance, we have the plain text, hello world. We're going to write. Um, from top to bottom, so we're going to do H-E-L-L-O-W-O-R-L-D, like as if like a, like the fence, like a, we're putting it on the top of a fence, I guess. Um, and so we write H-E-L-L-O-W-O-R-L-D, so we write it top to bottom, left to right, and we read it normally, so left to right, top to bottom. So the cipher text then is H L O O L E L W R L D. So what's a benefit of this versus the previous approach? Yeah. Yeah, the block size is as large as the plain text, right? It's the our characters can move, and our key here would be. Uh, how many rows and columns do we do? Or how many, I guess, rows do we do? Here we're doing two. Uh, we could think of do, using three in the same technique. We could do, um, we could read it off in different orders and write it out in different orders. But yeah, fundamentally here we're now mixing and transposing more characters across more of the key. So an attacker can't just reason about it in terms of blocks. Uh, they'd have to reason about it in a bigger way. Yeah. Ooh, interesting. I don't know. Um, yeah, that's an interesting thought. I don't know how that would impact. Uh, maybe if it was in your language, like that language would be particularly bad to do this way. Um, but I don't know if right to left, top to bottom writing would impact this. That's interesting. But I bet you could do it in the opposite way. That would be unexpected. Cool. So these are kind of simple things, and this is something you could just do on paper, right? This isn't a complex algorithm. It's going to definitely do that. Um, cool. So how do we decide? So more at a high level. So we're given some ciphertext. Maybe we don't even know what algorithm is used. How could we try to determine that? Okay, uh, so for the first, so for the uh, previous example, yeah, so we could H L O. So a, we can know that it's encrypted somehow because it doesn't make sense, right? Um, yeah. You could check the one gram just to see if oh, is this a transposition? 
distribution? Yeah, so we can check the one gram frequency. So we can look at the distribution of letters in English if it matches 100% uh, with English or matches very closely to English, but we can't read the message. That means it's probably a transposition cipher. If not, then that would tell us that it's a Caesar cipher. Or, sorry, that it's a uh, substitution cipher. Um, so then, okay, if we know then it's a substitution cipher, then how do we go farther to determine Caesar versus Visionaire? Yeah. Yeah, so we can, exactly, so we can actually just easily test Caesar cipher or even just brute force a Caesar cipher and see if that works. If it doesn't, you know, it's not a Caesar cipher. Um, we could use the index of coincidence. We can use um, correlation. We can use our statistical analysis. We can look at the frequencies. Uh, we can try to, uh, anyway, so these are all different ways that we can use to try to determine what it is. Um, in real world crypto, they actually use oftentimes um, XORs instead of shifts. So why is that? Somebody remind me, what is an XOR? Exclusive OR. So what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, so zero XOR zero is, or is that the only difference? Yes, so zero XOR zero is zero. And one XOR is zero is one, zero XOR is one is one, and one XOR is one is zero, right? Um, so why do you think they use this? So, in, so, okay, we talked about what it is. Why do they, do real systems maybe use this more than a shift? Yeah. It's trivially immutable on a computer. Yeah, it's true. It's very fast for computers to do this, and it's very, um, you don't have to worry about numbers being 0 to 25 and transferring the ASCII value to the number, blah, 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 whatever. You could just do an XOR. You XOR something into a value, and you XOR that same value back, and you get the, the original result. Um, so, okay, yeah. For, and I'll show you an example. We'll do this really quickly. Uh, don't implement your own crypto algorithms is what I've been trying to say for a long time. There are plenty of ways to get this wrong. Uh, there are side channel attacks. So there's all actually crazy research that they've shown that, um, uh, so they showed that if somebody can get access to the power readings of your system uh, while it's doing some encryption operation, they could break the key that way because different operations on a CPU use different amounts of power and you could figure out what those operations are by the power usage just outside the server. Then they went even crazier and um, used the sound that the fan makes because the fan noise is, um, is correlated with the power draw, which is correlated to what CPU operations are used. So they can actually break, just by listening to the fan noise, they could break your cryptographic keys uh, just by using that. Um, there's all kinds of techniques now where if somebody's executing on your machine, they can use a, a shared cache between your processes to try to determine what your keys are. There's also crazy things like timing attacks. So this is a very classic one. Of, it's, this is why it's incredibly difficult to write crypto operations because the amount of time it takes for a correct operation versus an incorrect must be identical. Otherwise, that leaks information to an adversary. So you can break crypto systems if they fail early sometimes or if some operations are take less time than others. Um, so I want to tell you one example before we go of a, uh, this was a DEF CON Qual's 2011 challenge that I worked on. It was called the binary leetness and the score was 300. So it was a tar archive. So it was just a zip file basically with a .dex file. So anybody know what a .dex file is or was? Anybody do Android development? So it's basically an Android app and JPEG S. So the S ostensibly stood for a, a secure. When we looked at this, and this is insane that this app still exists. So they used a real app that's on the Google Play Store. It's a free version and it says that it encrypts your photos with a, it does encryption on your photos. But what it does is it uses an eight byte key. Um, so eight bytes 
and it d does XOR. It's essentially a visionaire cipher that did eight bytes over repeating over your picture to save out this secure version. And your goal was to find out the key, and so we broke this because you can um, do certain things, like you know certain fields in a JPEG are always the same. There's magic bytes based on the structure of a JPEG. So you can use that to break um, and figure out, I think, at least three or four of the eight bytes. And then the rest you could actually just brute force until you generated a valid JPEG file. And then when we finally broke this, it, like the picture was a picture of a whiteboard with the flag written on it. Um, and this still exists. This is this app that you could go pay for and think that you're getting uh, securely storing your keys when, or your pictures when it does not. And so this is really sad. So the free version does not do any real encryption. It says it does. But you can pay money to get one that actually uses allegedly uh, real cryptographic operations. So people still use this stuff. Don't do it. Don't be that person. Uh, when we get back, we're going to talk about modern uh, encryption systems. Hey, the recording.